Hi, and welcome back to the Tough Talk with me, Faustina Anyangu on C Hub Magazine. And today I have, you know, a very special guest who is the CEO and publisher of Black Star News USA. He is also um, a graduate of the Columbia School of Journalism. He has written for the, you know, um, the Journal of Commerce, the New York Times, and the Wall Street, uh, Wall, Wall Street Journal. And right. so many other, you know, reputable news agencies and all that. Now, Mr. Alimadi is yes. a Mr. Alimadi is a Pan Africanist, and he has a very, you know, interesting views on issues about Africa. He is, of course, the son of the pri former Prime Minister of Uganda. So today, Mr. Alimadi, welcome to the show as we talk about Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, sir. Mr. Limadi, you know, there's this, this topic today is very interesting to me personally. And also, you know, we've had a lot of debate on, on this topic, which has divided a lot of opinions about, you know, the relationship between Africa and the West. Has it been yes. of mutual benefit? No, it has not been mutual benefit. Unfortunately, not. I think the beneficiaries have primarily been the Western countries because mm -hmm. they benefit from Africa's resources and cheap labor. And that has, uh, in, in fact, as you know, originally, the Western industrialization was made possible primarily due to the resources from African countries, okay. even during the colonial rule. And even after formal independence in the 1960s, that relationship has not changed substantially. So African countries still sell their raw materials at a relatively very low price, and they import manufactured products from the West at an extremely relatively higher price than the amount they get for their raw materials. So I would not say it's been mutually beneficial. It should be, but it is not. Now let's look at from the 15th century to 19th century when we had the slave trade, you know, and um, uh, th th there's a view, you know, uh, yeah, there are so many views around this each topic. Some people say um, the, the white or the West wouldn't have really taken Africans to slavery without the help of Africans. How do you react to that? I think we can't see it as a blanket statement. Okay. I think in every situation, you're always going to find elements who cooperate with the people that oppress them. And you find people that resist. So for example, let's look at the period of conquest of Africa. When the African continent was conquered during the last 20 years of the 19th century, there were some African leaders who did not resist. Perhaps they thought it was futile to resist people that had much more powerful weapons, the Maxim gun, for example. Okay. But there were many Africans who resisted. People like Samori Toure in West Africa. He fought the French and won many, many victories. And then you have in Ethiopia, Empress Taitu and Emperor Menelik they defeated an invading Italian army, which was commanded by five generals. That was the Battle of Adwa on March 1, 1896. Yeah. So we cannot have a blanket statement. There were other people that resisted, and then there were those who collaborated with the people who oppressed Africa. Okay. Now, why has it taken, somebody you know, has asked this question, why has it taken Africa so long, even till now, you know, to um, understand, one, understand our parts, understand our mistakes, and be able to stand up? That's a very good question. And that is a question that we need to address carefully. Okay. Africans who have tried to disseminate information that I think would be much more helpful are normally eliminated. Okay. So, for example, 
by the people who benefit from Africa's condition of underdevelopment. Because if Africa is underdeveloped, it means something, someone is benefiting from that condition. So historically, the people that had colonized Africa would prefer to see Africa underdeveloped. And why do I say that? It means you will buy your products at any price that they dictate. And that is how they maintain the over you. So for Ghana became independent. Kwame Nkrumah said this. He said, unless we change the structural economic relationship, our independence would be meaningless. It would be like after independence equals before independence. So he said, this is what we need to do. We need to use our, our natural resources to manufacture products that we can sell to the West. So in the case of Ghana, we should not be selling cocoa. <laughs> we should build factories using power from the Volta project and produce chocolate because you get a lot more money by selling chocolate to the rest of the world. So if you grow tea like Kenya, you would actually put it in the packages that you, the whole world buys tea in and then sell it to the rest of the world. Don't just sell it as raw tea that has not yet been processed. So when Krumah tried to do this, I think many people in the West realized that Krumah was setting a bad example for the West, but a good example for Africa. <laughs> because if many African countries that able, had been able to pursue Nkrumah's roadmap, mm -hmm. African countries would today be, be competing with the Western countries, manufacturing products and selling manufactured products to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But African countries won independence in the 1960s, they were selling raw material. Today, in the 21st century, African countries are still selling raw materials. And that is a problem. That has to change. That is the only way African countries can build wealth and prosperity by industrialization. Okay. Now, you, you said that's the only way that will change. Uh, you know, the, the, the relationship can change. Who is going to implement that? Yes. Here? Who will implement Very it? good. You ask. I, 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 I like that question because that Nkrumah also provided that answer. He said, Africa is not going to develop based on the goodwill of the developed countries. Because it does not make sense. Why would an industrialized developed country want to create more competition? <laughs> so he said the solution is going to have to come from African countries. So that answer remains the same today. It has to come from African countries. We have to have an African agenda. We have to have an African plan. And we have to agree with it collectively. So for example, the European Union, they may have their disputes. They always have disputes. They always argue. But at the end of the day, they agree on some things that they can all benefit from. They harmonize the economic policies. Even though, for example, Britain is withdrawing from the EU, Britain is still negotiating a partnership agreement with the EU country because they realize the importance on being on the same page when it comes to economic issues. So African countries need to adopt the same kind of attitude. So for example, if Zambia produces copper and Congo also produces copper, Zambia and Congo need to have harmonized price. You cannot allow a Western country to come to Zambia and then if Zambia wants a certain price for its copper, then the Western country is gonna say, no, I'm going to go to Congo and get it at half the price you're selling it to me. Mm. That would undermine the industry for both the Zambia and the Congo. And those are the kind of mentality and the kind of agreements that African countries have to work on. We have to harmonize our economic 
economic uh, policies so that we can all benefit in our dealings with the industrialized countries. One of an outspoken critic, critic of um, especially the um, Nigerian government and generally the African leaders, who is a, an advocate for humanity, he says that, you know, that all, almost all African leaders are uh, administrators, you know, leading on behalf of the West, their masters in the West. Absolutely. Yeah, and with that mentality, you know, do you think that in the nearest future that Africa is going to be able to actualize all what you stated just now? Yes, absolutely. And I'll tell you why. Because they can change. So for example, in Uganda, youth unemployment is 85%. So in Uganda, we have a dictator, General Museveni, who's been there for 32 years, but he will not last too long. I would be very surprised if he lasts more than two or three more years. Why is this? Because the youth, when they have nothing to do and they have no income, quite naturally, they're going to take their destiny in their own hands. So you will see increasingly dictators that are not delivering are going to be pushed out of power. Don't you think that, you know... Now... Sorry, the example in Burkina Faso. Okay. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Now, don't you think that, you know, like... The same thing is happening with Nigeria. More than 80% of the youth yes. you know, are the major you know, uh, um, count of the population are unemployed and have yes. And when you look yes. at Nigeria now, look at Nigeria 10 years back and look at Nigeria today. You can see how the security of the country has yeah. just you know, been messed up completely. Now, with the yes. youth being impoverished, don't you think they become a safe haven for, for the West to instigate as usual? Well, I think the new generation have a different type of mentality because they see how young people are also making changes in other parts of the world, including in the West. They see how young people, for example, have been able to change the politics in the United States uh, with the advantage of social media, they're able to learn some of those strategies. So, for example, in the Congo right now, the young people in the Congo are seeing how young people in the United States come up to the streets, come out and use social media to mobilize, to protest, to demonstrate, to push for change. In the Congo, I think that has had a tremendous impact. I think without young people coming out into the streets, Kabila, Joseph Kabila would not have agreed to hold elections by the end of this year. It's because of the young people coming out to the streets and demanding change. So I think these same young people are not going to be willing to be recolonized by the Western countries. I think they have a different type of mentality. I think they believe they can determine their own destiny. In fact, the reason they're coming out to the street is because they don't like the fact that a leader like Kabila is actually an agent for Western, Western countries. He fulfills the needs of the Western multinational companies instead of the needs of the people of Congo. So I think that kind of example is going to be duplicated in more African countries. We saw it in Burkina Faso, we're seeing it in South Africa, and I think increasingly, we will see that in Nigeria as well. I think by, the, by 10 years from now, most African countries are going to be governed by relatively much, much younger generation of leaders. It's inevitable, it has to happen, because everybody has a limit. And when you reach your limit, you have nothing to lose, and you need to seize your own destiny. So yeah. either the leaders that are in office today start making quick reform, or they will become history. Okay. No, um, I understand that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. That the West African nations, you know, we are much more hit by the um, slave trade, and we are much yes. more better during the slave trade, which 
makes me think personally that you know i think the the disadvantage of that this relationship with the west is more you know is, is affecting the western countries more and you can right. see, you can see it clearly with nigeria with the amount right. and everything that is happening there look at the population of nigeria and look at what is happening right. for example you see that almost right every time you see the senators of nigeria even the nigerian president right. always coming to london you know right so and how do you look at that relation do you think that we have really learned anything <laughs> yes i think we have learned a lot we have learned and i think i have a little more faith in the younger generation of africans the nigerians that are coming to London right now are still, how should I say, not mentally decolonized. But I think the majority of Nigerian youth would prefer to guide and determine their own destiny. And it can be done. For example, for example, in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. before Thomas Sankara came to power in 1983, mm -hmm. the people in Burkina Faso, which it was the, was then called the Upper Volta. Mm -hmm. They did not believe they could really guide their own destiny because that's all they had been taught since colonial era and even after the colonial era. Mm -hmm. But it took one individual, Thomas Sankara, to change the mindset. And he started by saying, number one, why do you import food from outside? Think about that. If you don't grow your own food in and the people reacted positively to the lessons that he showed, he said, why do you import clothes from outside when you grow the cotton, when you know how to produce your own clothes? Even though Sankara was killed prematurely, I think people never forgot the lessons Sankara taught. And when Blaise Compaoré, the dictator, was ultimately driven out from Burkina Faso, the youth were invoking the name of Thomas Sankara. So if one person could provide that kind of lesson in one African country, I don't see why it cannot be duplicated in many other African countries. It means the desire is there. People just need the correct messaging because it's inexcusable for African countries to create wealth for the Western world. Think about that. Exactly. Africa has all of the resources that they need to build their wealth. <laughs> and yet we just, we're practically giving it away for free. That must stop. So when we have the right kind of lessons, I think it will stop. That is why it's so puzzling for, you know, for people to, people wonder, even, you know, even the Western population here of course their media yes. you know, gloss over things that are happening so most of their yes. population don't even know their own history in regards to relation with africa now absolutely time what we see peddled all over the media is you know aid and you know helping these guys of helping africa which exactly we are, we are beginning now to know that is actually not help Recently, the um, even though I'm not a fan of the the leader of um, Congo as it is now, but recently he right. yeah he refused the offer of the United Nations for you know fundraising for the country. Was that a good move for the nation? I think, and I agree with you. I don't support him either. The messaging is right, but the messenger is the wrong messenger <laughs> because he has stolen so much money from the Congo. But the message that he's trying to communicate is correct. We don't need peanuts really from the West because we have the resources that we need for development. And also, I am happy that you raised the level of, of ignorance about Africa and Western relationship with Africa in the West because they are not provided uh, the proper information. Because if they were, they would realize that, in fact, the 
African countries, in terms of the resource flow, in terms of the money flow, the money comes from Africa to the industrial countries almost 10 times more. In terms of those loans, when African countries pay the interest on the loans, by the time they, in fact, they never get to repay the loans entirely. And the Western countries like it that way. Those loans are not meant to be repaid because they make money from the interest. If the loans were repaid, it means they would stop making the money, you see? So it means net transfer of money is not from the West to Africa. It is in fact from Africa to the West. And that must end. We must generate capital from within African countries. And how do we do that? We do it by making sure we get more money from the raw materials we sell to the West. And then we can use that profit to build our factories, to build up social services. But instead, what happens? When the World Bank comes to an African country, what is the first thing they say? They say you must cut social services before we can give you loan. Can you imagine? So people cut health, people cut education, so how can you build skilled workforce if you're not educating your people? How can you keep your people healthy if they cannot even afford to go to clinics? But those are the conditions that the World Bank gives you before they give you loan. No, um... I don't know any country that has become industrialized by depending on the World Bank and the IMF. It will never happen. It will never happen. In fact, China, China is industrial now, today, right? China did not become industrialized by getting a bank. In fact, China now is growing because it's using raw materials from African countries, right? I, I was going to come there. Now, um, there's something that bothers me a lot about us Africans, you know. Yes. In theory, we know a lot about what yes. To found wrong, but it's I agree with you. Yes, it's not so long to turn around things now. Um, yes, and somebody will begin to wonder if you have had a deal with somebody, let's make it as an individual now. You've had a deal with somebody over five decades, five centuries, and right. this will in this relationship, you keep you know, you keep being cheated on and you keep right. complaining. Yet each right. time you fall, you, you know, you fall victim again. Yes. Does that not mean yes. that intellectually we are still not there? Okay, that's a good point you make. But I would, I, would, uh, I would beg to differ a little. I think we have the intellectual capacity, but we present a threat. Because look at what happened to Thomas Sankara. You see? Yeah. But Thomas look at Sankara. what happened. Sorry, Thomas, what happened to Kwame so, Thomas Sankara, even Kwame Krumah, even the, the, the recent Gaddafi and all that, you know, we are all, you know, eliminated by using his, their own people. Now, exactly. this is still what happened if you look back into history. So that means we still have a lot of people in our population, in our nation. Of course are still cowards who are still of there course. you know so absolutely i agree with you but even in families you can have a family you know if you want to very personalize it even within a single family you can have people that may have a game plan an agenda that would benefit the family so the family can prosper but if you have an outside person from the outside world whose number one mission is to ruin and disrupt that family. They will always find that one person. It can only be one person in the family. And that one person can poison the entire family. So that risk is always there. And that has, to, I, I'm putting it in the most simple terms, but it's true. In the case of Thomas Ankara, he was killed by his best, so-called best friend, Blaise Kampuare, right? <laughs> in, in, in Ghana, Nkrumah was overthrown by his own generals. In uh, the Congo, Patrice Lumumba was overthrown by the person that he made the commander of the army, 
Joseph Mobutu. So I agree with you. But we take from these lessons and we continue because we cannot abandon the march. No. Here is one thing I know. Here's one thing I know. Africa will always have the resources because it's in the ground. What we need is to find a group of people, African leaders, who can harmonize their intellectual capacity and say, listen, let's be on the same page for at least five, 10 years. We will be able to transform this part of the continent. So let me give you another example. I like some of the examples we're seeing from the ECOWAS countries. They've decided that they're going to no longer tolerate people that take over power using the gun. They're not going to tolerate dictators anymore in West African countries. That may be a, sound like a small thing, but it's a very big thing. I think the next generation of leaders should then say, we are going to harmonize our economic policy and we will not tolerate one person or one country that will try to undermine this uniform policy. They've proven that it can be done when it comes to the political leadership, no more dictatorship. If they adopt that on economic issues as well, then I think Africa is in the right direction. Now, um, we, we, we've talked about, um, you know, the, you know, I'm still on the intellectual part of yes. what is happening with us. Yes, yes. I, I know that historically, when um, Africa was conquered or during this yes. every time, most of the, not most, uh, you know, the, the West, they, they deprived Africans from education and developing themselves, which I think might be an issue on this one. But now, yes. when you look at some of the things that you pointed out, you ask yourself, why do, you, why do we continue to have leaders who don't understand these things we are talking about? Why do we have leaders who will stay there? Western countries will come and decide who leads their country, who remove, you know, they decide to remove who they think is who. Right, right. No. Part of it, yeah. part of it is also psychological. You know, it's psychological damage, you know? There is inferiority complex as well. You know that. There are many Africans who still think nothing good can be produced in Africa, by Africa, for Africans, you know? So there's that psychological conditioning also that we need to overcome. Uh, what I like from, I, I disagree with a lot of what Dambisa Moyo said in her book about uh, uh, dead, dead aid. But I agreed with one thing. So for example, she gave an example of the Asian countries, right? In fact, some of them are even much more corrupt, the leadership, than African countries. Yeah. But she said there's something they call positive corruption. They steal the money, they spend it in their own countries. They build in their own countries with the money that is embezzled, mm -hmm. as opposed to African leaders who send the money to a Swiss bank account. Why would you want to do that? And then it goes back, even Julius Nyerere, the late Julius Nyerere, president of Tanzania. He said, in Tanzania, the contract to build the road would go to the president's or the prime minister's son. In an Asian country, the same thing. The contract would also go to the prime minister's son. But the only difference in the Asian country, the road would actually get built, you know? <laughs> and he gave that as a joking example, but to many extents, it's true. If they're going to be damaging, why don't you let some of the benefits at least remain in Africa? In fact, I would prefer Mobutu when he was stealing all the billions in Congo. Why didn't he use it in another African country? Go to your friend, at that time his friend was the president of Gabon. Go build in Gabon. At least it's still staying in Africa and not going to a, uh, to a, to a, to a Swiss bank. But I agree with you. I agree with you in that we cannot constantly make excuses. 
and I hope I'm not making an excuse. I'm saying that the Africans that are conscious should see that it is very important for us to remove bad leaders from each and every African country. So for example, why should Uganda have one person as president for 32 years? That's he changed the constitution, removed age limit, removed the term limit. Now he can be life president. So that's why I am constantly encouraging the youth in Uganda to seize their destiny and do whatever it can legitimately to, to make sure that we a dictator like that from power. Because the longer they stay, the more damage they do to the future of Africa and the youth of Africa. Very interesting, you know, um, um, points you are bringing out now. And um, in still in this psychological conditioning and intellectual thing yeah. that I challenge about us, which we really, probably we haven't really thought about it, you know, in depth, because we have a lot of, even Africans who have studied here in the West, yeah. Mm -hmm. how things are done, who have seen how people embrace their own culture and their own right. thing. Now, right, you, right. You, publish, you publish a newspaper, you know. Yes. And I don't know if you have, if you have had this experience. When you approach our so-called African elites or educated right. people, or people who think they've reached a certain point, you know, right. they, look, they continuously look down on African media. Any yes, media of course. An African. So don't you think that that is an intellectual deficit? It is, but it will not stop me. In fact, you raise a very good question. Much of the financial support for the Black Star News uh, over the many years has come from non-Africans. Non Exactly. You see? But there were people who, when they see a good message and they think it's an effective message, not always have to be fellow Africans. Sometimes our people learn a little later. Then they start to see that, in fact, this is beneficial. So, for example, my publication now benefits many African countries. It benefits Ugandans who are resisting against a tyrant. They come to see, in fact, there are some articles that even journalists in Uganda, in Uganda because they, they, they would be retaliation by the dictator. So those journalists actually publish it in the Black Star News because I'm based in New York. It would have... You cut off there. If you can, if you can repeat the that. The positive benefits of the Black Star News. Yeah. No, I'm saying in the beginning, they may ha not have seen the Black Star News as something that could benefit them. But now they do see the Black Star News as something that will benefit them and that has actually benefited them. So now they become much more willing to support. Sometimes they may come late into the game, but I think if you do something, something that has benefits consistently in time, the support will come. Yes, the, the support will come, but now in terms of, um, you see, like uh, we've been here, you know, for a while, if, if you see even an ordinary, Western blogger who starts today, an African, regardless of their yeah. height, jump at any interview, you know, shown to them. But then even an African media, you know, that's yes. the, is, you know, they first of all will look at you like that before they that's even if they ever, you know, respond to you. So my my point here right. generally. No, I agree. I agree with you. You know, so making a very and for example, India, right? Yeah, because these are the things here in the United States. Yeah, these are, don't you think that these are the things that are still keeping Africa down? Because if there are information to 
Are you with me? Hello? Are you hearing me? Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, if there are, if there are, you know, don't you think that these are things that, that are still keeping us down because our people continue to rely on the Western media, which glosses over the information. Yes. And remember also that down in Africa, the history, in fact, I began to know more about slavery, the impact of slavery, and even colonization, yes. and the, 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 the consequences or the damages that were done to our ancestors that were you know, enslaved here. I only got to know deeply and yeah. emotionally about it when I came to England. As at the time I was in Nigeria, yes. there was no such information, not in school, not in the, our, yes. and not even in the Western media either. So until you come yes. here, you yeah. meet the people who have experienced it and see the anger, you begin to wonder why the anger, and then you begin to do your own research. Now, if our people yeah. refuse yes. to accept and support, yes. of, of, oh, I don't like the word support when it comes to business, because when they are listening to CNN and all those, they don't call it support, they wholeheartedly digest everything that is given to them. Now, why is it taking us so long to identify things that are for us, that are beneficial to us, support it and make it grow, to be able to compete in the world? Because I think, don't have the kind of discussion that we are having right now. We don't have enough of it. You know, a, a child who is naturally intelligent can also be miseducated most of his or her life, right? So for example, I know it probably applies there in Britain as well. You have intelligent black uh, children in this country who from a very early age they are told by certain teachers that they will never amount to anything. They will never be able to achieve anything. So they internalize this inferiority. They may even be the most intelligent student in the class, but they are fed this inferiorization from a very early age, right? Okay. So we need to have the kind of discussion that you brought here today. We need to talk openly about these things and let our people think about it. Why do we tend to disregard Fellow Africans, for example, why is that? Let the, we, let's raise this question, let people think about it. And that's part of the education that we need. We need to educate our people. Thomas Sankara educated people in Burkina Faso that they could do for themselves, and they believed in it. And you can see how they changed. They became much more confident. He said, why do you need to wait for somebody to come from Europe to build a railway? And he rolled up his sleeves. And he showed them. There's a film that I strongly recommend. It's called Thomas Sankara, The Upright Man. I think every African should see that film and see how the people of Burkina Faso, who were intellectually uh, still colonized to France, were liberated just by this one man sending out the correct messaging. So I say that to say that you and I and other people in media can disseminate that kind of information to our African audience on a regular basis, consistently. Thank you, sir. You That's what we must do. Yes. You mentioned um, France. Now, that reminded me of um, the relationship between the Francophone you know, um, nations with France that they colonized. Yes. Yeah. It's true that these countries still pay, you know, pay tax. France. And their economy is tied because the, 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 the French, the, 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 the West African uh, currency, you know, it's still, uh, it's still uh, connect related to the French franc. So whatever policies that the French government uh, decides to pursue, it has impact on the West African countries. So that gives you an example of how what uh, what Nkrumah called neo-colonialism is still having impact and holding back countries. It's the other way around. Those countries don't need France. France would not have the standard of living 
that it has today. But they have a leadership that is still mentally tied up to France. And that is part of the problem. So how can we... In uh, fact, let me give you one other example. How let can me give you one example. Okay. Yeah, go on. A few months ago, an African journalist asked uh, President Macron, the French president, would France consider a Marshall Plan for African countries, for West African countries? Dismissive and contemptuous. He said, it's not so much needing the financing, it's management of families. For example, the women in West African countries have too many babies. As racist as it gets, number one. Number two, totally upside down and incorrect. When France had colonized the West African countries, conscripted 300,000 West Africans to fight for France in World War I. Not, had that not happened, the French would be speaking German today because they wouldn't have any. In fact, the reparations should be coming the other way around. They should compensate those West African soldiers who fought and kept France free. You see? In his mind. Otherwise, he would not have made that kind of response to that uh, journalist. Exactly. And there was no outrage, uh, you know, from that time, um, you know, if it's here. Pretty good. That's another good point. There was, there was no outrage. There was no outrage. I agree with you. In fact, I, a person from East Africa, was much more outraged <laughs> than the journalist in West Africa by that response. In fact, I tweeted it. And I made sure I put that Macron's uh, hashtag on, the, uh, on and his Twitter handle when I tweeted. I said, Macron, you owe an apology to, to Africa. Had those 300,000 soldiers from Africa not fought on behalf of France, French, they would be speaking German today. Have more of that kind of reaction. I just come from an East African journalist. All the journalists in West Africa, all African journalists should have responded in that same way. If we did, next time he would think twice before he gave that kind of answer again. Exactly. And that brings me now to, you know, the, um, you know what is happening in, in UK now, the Windrush um, saga. Now, when you look at um, Britain, you know, in the history, their relationship with the Commonwealth and all that, then all of a sudden, you know, since they've been in the EU, enjoying the you know EU relationship and all that, the Commonwealth was you know became like a second fiddle. Then all of a sudden, they're out of the EU and they've all wholeheartedly come back to embrace Commonwealth. And I see a lot of right. all, all our African countries in the, that in this Commonwealth, all of them coming like you know like ch children coming back to take their Christmas. Gift. Yeah. I agree with you. And you know what? And many of them are mentally colonized. They want to be appreciated by Europeans. And they see that as a level of achievement that have been recognized by European. It means I'm, that is very sad because you're the one who has the resources that Europe wants from you. <laughs> it should be the other way around. Why should we, you be thinking you are attaining something by being in London? If you want to continue the Commonwealth meetings, let it be in an African country every year. And they will come if you, if you dictate it the right way. Why would they come? Because you have the resources, but you're debasing yourself making the proper demands that you need to be making. And if you're debasing yourself, why should the person who is benefiting from you debasing yourself, why should they change the equation? Okay. They're happy with it. Exactly. They're happy with it. And you don't have to blame them, don't you? 
No, you don't blame them because they're serving the interest of their country and their population. I was speaking with somebody the other day about the same topic. I said, if a thief stops stealing, then I know something is wrong. If the thief wants to fulfill his interest and his profession is stealing, then he will continue stealing. And nothing will make him stop unless you make that thief stop. But on his own, if you leave the windows open, the thief will come in. You leave the door open, the thief will come in. And then you cannot blame the thief. Yes. Now, to conclude, you know, we've, had, we've really had a very interesting discussion. What word, what message do you want to leave for um, African elites, the intellectuals, yes. the yes. elites, and whoever is in any form of leadership in Africa? Right. Okay, first of all, I feel very proud as a Pan-African, to be honest with you. I'm very happy every day I wake up with my Pan-African thoughts and messages and I like to share with people and interact with other Pan-Africans. And why do I say this? Because I know Africa has the land that the West wants. We have like two thirds of the, of, the, um, of the fertile land that is still not used in the world. We have the, 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 uh, the, the, the sun for energy. We have the rivers and lakes. Uh, we have the resources in the ground. We have everything that the world wants. All we need to do is decolonize our minds. And I know that will ultimately happen. And Africa will have a better tomorrow in the future. But it will not happen by itself. So people who are on the intellectual right plane should share, share that message, especially to the youth. Tell the youth of Africa that if you are unemployed today, if you are poor, it is not your fault. It's because the leadership has not been correct. But ultimately, once you seize your own destiny, you're going to create a better Africa for the future. And that's what I would like to leave with every, particularly the young generation of Africans. The future is yours. The West wants your resources. China wants your resources. It's yours. Make sure you use it for your own benefit, and it will happen. Thank you so much, Mr. Alimadi. You've really Thank you. enlightened us so much, and I hope that our people will you know, take so much from what you know, you've just told us today. And probably, and of course, I hope that they do their own research to have this thing yes. to our subconscious so that we can start behaving differently about all the things that we've talked about. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Once. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.